be careful climbing down. Your peonies lean their vast heads westward as if they might topple, some topple. Don mentioned, I know, the uh, stanza, the stanzaic poems that I wrote out of my love for Thomas Hardy and out of my grief for Jane. And I thought I'd read uh, a couple of them now. Uh, one is called uh, Summer Kitchen. In June's high light, she stood at the sink with a glass of wine and listened for the bobolink and crushed garlic in late sunshine. I watched her cooking from my chair. She pressed her lips together, reached for kitchenware, and tasted sauce from her fingertips. It's ready now. Come on, she said. You light the candle. We ate and talked and went to bed and slept. It was a miracle. One more of these uh, hardiest poems, not his language, but the kind of stanza he wrote. The Wish. I keep her weary ghost inside me. Oh, let me go, I hear her crying. Deep in your dark you want to hide me and so perpetuate my dying. I can't undo the grief that you weep by the stone where I am lying. Oh, let me go. By work and women, half distracted, I endure the day and sleep at night to watch her dying reenacted when the cold dawn descends like twilight. How can I let this dream forget her white withdrawal from my sight and let her go? Her body, as I watch, grows smaller. Her face recedes, her kiss is colder. Watching her disappear, I call her, come back as I grow old and older. While somewhere deep in the catch of sleep, I hear her cry as I reach to hold her. Oh, let me go. A great deal of uh, without uh, is in the form of letters to her, written after her death. Oh, one day uh, I heard that one of our nurses in Seattle, who had just married, was pregnant. And the first thought I had, and this happens to everyone who loses someone close, was, oh, Jane will, nah, you know, Jane would like to hear it. I sat down and began to write her a letter. And many people have written letters to their own dead. Uh, I wrote mine in the form of lines and, uh, for about a year. The last of them is called a, a letter after a year. But I'm going to read just the first one, which is called uh, Letter with No Address. Your daffodils rose up and collapsed in their yellow bodies on the hillside garden. Above the bricks you laid out in sand, squatting with pants pegged and face masked like a beekeeper's against the black flies. Buttercups circled the planks of the old wellhead this May, while your silken body withers or molds in the Proctor graveyard. I drive and talk to you crying and come back to this house to talk to your photographs. There's news to tell you. Maggie Fisher's pregnant. I carried myself like an egg at Abigail's birthday party a week after you died as three-year-olds bounced uproarious on the mattress. Joyce and I met for lunch at the mall and strolled weepily through Sears and B. Dalton. Today, it's four weeks since you lay on our painted bed 
and I closed your eyes. Yesterday I cut irises to set in a pitcher on your grave. Today I brought a carafe to fill it with fresh water. I remember bone pain, vomiting, delirium. I remember pond afternoons. My routine is established. Coffee, the globe, breakfast, writing you this letter at my desk. When I go to bed to sleep after baseball, Gus follows me into the bedroom as he used to follow us. Most of the time he flops down in the parlor with his head on his paws. Once a week I drive to Tilton to see Dick and Nan. Nan doesn't understand much, but she knows you're dead. I feel her fretting. The tune of Dick and me talking seems to console her. You know now whether the soul survives death or you don't. When you were dying, you said you didn't fear punishment. We never dared to speak of paradise. At 5 a.m., while I walk outside, mist lies thick on hayfields. By 8, the air is clear, cool, sunny, with the pale yellow light of mid-May. Kearsarge rises huge and distinct, each birch and balsam visible to the west the waters of Eagle Pond waver and flash through popples just leafing out. Always the weather, writing its book of the world, returns you to me. Ordinary days were best when we worked over poems in our separate rooms. I remember watching you gaze out the January window into the garden of snow and ice, your face wrapped as you imagined burgundy lilies. Your presence in this house is almost as enormous and painful as your absence. Driving home from Tilton, I remember how you cherished that vista with its center of the red door of the farmhouse against green fields. Are you past pity if you have consciousness now? If something I can call you as something like consciousness, I doubt you remember the last days. I play them over and over. I lift your wasted body onto the commode, your arms looped around my neck, aiming your bony bottom so that it will not bruise on the rail. Faintly, you repeat, mama, mama, Three times today I drove to your grave. Sometimes, coming back home to our circular driveway, I imagine you've returned before me, bags of groceries upright in the back of the sob, its trunk lid delicately raised, as if proposing an encounter, dog fashion, with the Honda. <laughs> the Jane who talked about me being a huge blue condom, uh, would have laughed. I'm just going to read a couple more, and then we'll go to some uh, questions. just decided to read. It's called a distressed haiku. There are three line uh, stanzas, but they're not haiku. Uh, and they're, it's very brief. Uh, In a week or 10 days, the snow and ice will melt from cemetery road. I'm coming. Don't move. You think that their dying is the worst thing that could happen. Then they stay dead. The mouse rips the throat of the lion. The Boston Red Sox win 100 